This morning we're going to, as we always have in this series, start out by looking at our primary passage, which comes from 1 Corinthians 13. If I can go ahead and get it back. Uh, 13, 13. But now faith, hope, and love remain, these three, but the greatest of these is love. And since this is the, the greatest of the three, the pressure's really on to make this the best lesson out of the three. So I'm going to do the best that I can on that one. And you may remember that I started out this series and I ask you to, as we're going through it, to keep three questions in your mind about these three virtues. One is, why are faith, hope, and love the primary virtues that are discussed in 1 Corinthians 13.3? What is the significance of each virtue singularly and as a group? So not only how do they operate by themselves, but also why are those three strung together the way that they are in that passage? And finally, how do we cultivate these virtues in ourselves and others? That's really the application of the lessons that we've been going over these past couple of weeks. And just like Jesus said to his disciples, he sort of phrased some of his questions in this way when he asked, so who do you say that I am and who do others say that I am? And so we did the same with all of these. And uh, apparently there's a typo on this one. Uh, it, it actually should be, what do people say love is? This is the definition of love. So uh, I forgot to change that from last week, but I do have the actual definition from dictionary.com here. And of all of the different virtues, faith, hope, and love that we've gone over, we've gone over several different ones, but in each of the definitions, I could kind of see where they were coming from, even though I thought that it was an incomplete definition or maybe not a definition that the Bible would give. I have to say, as I went through the definition of love, there were several of them that I thought were not just, you know, maybe not as conclusive or not as precise as I would want from a spiritual sense. These actually seem to be actively way off, honestly. So if we're talking about a noun, the way it defines it is a profound, tender, passionate affection for another person, a feeling of warm personal attachment or deep affection as for a parent, child, or friend. Uh, it also uses it as sexual passion or desire. When we're talking about a verb, it says, you know, to love, for example. Uh, it says to have affection, uh, love or affection for. It says to have a profoundly tender, passionate affection for another person, to have a strong liking for, to take great pleasure in, to need to require, to benefit greatly from, to embrace and kiss someone as a lover. Again, that one's a little bizarre. Uh, or, uh, you know, to uh, have sexual intercourse with, which again, I find is, is way off. And so, of all the different virtues that we've looked over, I could kind of see that there was an aspect of what the Christian understanding of what hope would be or what faith would be. I have to say, when I'm looking through these definitions, I think that these are mostly incorrect. And so there's a little bit of a difference here, and I think that that goes to say that there is a profound misunderstanding of the world when it comes to what love actually is. So with that being said, um, I was kind of looking at the idea of, of what do people in the world say love is. So I wanted to go ahead and open up the floor to you. What, what, do you, what do other people say that love is? What does the world say about love? Okay, so that's something we saw in the definitions that we just looked at, right? This idea that love is more of a feeling than uh, some objective thing that you can have. And so it's, it's almost as though it's, it's floating around in the ether and it's unexplainable. And so that tends to be something that I think people generally, the, the image that is conjured up in their head when they talk about love. Anything else? So you're saying they're defining it that way because they're sort of conjuring or speaking into existence their desire of what they would rather love be than what it actually is. So I think that there's probably a, a good amount of people, I wouldn't say it's all the people, but I would say that there's a good amount of people that are kind of what you're talking about where they kind of, want love to be this, therefore that's how they define it. It's, it's sort of like uh, um, they're, they're, they're couching it in those terms because that's what they would prefer love to actually be. And then there are those that are just misinformed. So there's probably a mix of both. There's some people that are actually misinformed and don't understand what love is. And there's some people that actually have a pretty good idea of it, but they'd rather it be something else. And so I think what you're, what you're speaking to is correct. Yeah, I think that that's correct as well. A lot of this misinformation is coming from external examples or external instances that we see 
of people treating love exactly like some of the definitions that we just saw. So a good example this week, and generally speaking, I don't keep up with entertainment news, but somehow this one wiggled its way into my news feed. Uh, there was some country singer this week that I saw that had announced that she's getting divorced from uh, her husband, and the explanation that she gave in one of the interviews is that the reason that she was getting divorced was because, and this is her words, not mine, the glitter had gone away. She's only been married five years. But the point is, she had essentially decided, and I think she's only like 26, 27, something like that, she had essentially just decided that because she's not getting that feeling that we normally see in the media, you know, uh, I, by the way, I'm not trying to drag people down with this. This is just an observation. If you, especially this time of year, if you watch the Hallmark Channel, uh, somehow these people are able to fall madly in love in, you know, an hour and a half. Um, but the, the point of all that is, and there's nothing wrong with that, it's entertaining, I get that people like them, it's not really my cup of tea, but the point is, there's nothing wrong with liking those things. However, if you inundate yourself with that sort of rose-colored glasses version of what love is, and then you actually engage in a relationship with somebody, and it doesn't have to be a romantic relationship, but that's a good example of it, and then it doesn't turn out the way that it turns out in the movie to where you're just deliriously happy or euphoric for the rest of your life, you suddenly think that there's something wrong because that's what you've been fed your whole life to think what love is. And so because of that, I think that that's where a lot of that misinformation that you're talking about comes from. So th these are a couple of the ones that I came up with, and, and they're really just kind of summaries of what have already been said so far. Um, we will use it to mean a strong desire for literally anything. There are a lot of things that I desire. I desire to get to Bible class on time and not oversleep. Uh, it doesn't always happen. But the point is that there is a strong desire of things they could say you love that thing. But that's not really what love means in the biblical sense. Uh, when you're very hungry, you may strongly desire food, for example, but that doesn't mean you love the food in the biblical sense. Uh, one of the things that we've discussed is sexual fulfillment. People will misconstrue it. They actually will use the verbiage that uh, two people are making love. But that's not necessarily what happens. Sometimes it is. Ideally it is, of course, because it should happen within the confines of a marriage. But generally speaking, we will use the word to mean that, even though that might not actually be what's going on. Acceptance, tolerance, affirmation, these things are very often confused with love in our modern world. They think that the highest form of love is just accepting somebody exactly how they are. And by the way, this is not something that the church is immune to. We would typically think of this definition as that's something that the world would come up with as what they think love is. But the truth is, this kind of thinking has snuck its way into the church. There are people in the church that believe that the highest good or the most godlike quality you can have is just accepting people exactly the way they are. Now, there is an aspect of truth to that, but the truth is there's no verse anywhere in the scripture that calls us to tolerate people. You know, if you're a doctor and there's somebody dying right in front of you and you can help them, you could do nothing and technically be tolerant. You're not hurting them. You're not doing anything to discriminate against them, but you're not helping them. The loving thing to do would be to help them. And so there's a distinction there. People talk about tolerance as though it's this great virtue, and tolerance, generally speaking, is not necessarily a bad thing. However, we have to understand as Christians, God doesn't call us to tolerance. He calls us to love. Tolerance is the bare minimum, and it usually winds up turning into apathy, to be perfectly honest. And then finally, uh, we have happiness or euphoria, the sort of idea that we were talking about a second ago, that there's just going to be endless bliss for all time. Now, that actually is an aspect that's going to happen when it comes to the idea of paradise, even though I think that we, we sometimes misconstrue that, but I won't go off into that. Uh, but, but it's this idea that you're just going to be constantly happy no matter what you do. That's what love is, and that's simply not the case. Or, you know, in the case of some of us, Whataburger. Uh, but <laughs> that's, that's my personal one. Um, but, you know, I, I do bring this up, actually, for a real reason. If you look at the Hebrew understanding of the word love, the, the, the Hebrew word for love, it's actually derived from the word I give. So... When we talk about, oh, I, I love this thing or I love that thing, th this goes back to the definition we were looking for earlier to, to strongly desire something. You know, there are times where, I'll just be honest, I strongly desire a Whataburger, but that's not necessarily love. 
because what love means in the Hebrew is to give. So, in a sense, your food can give to you because it is something that you're taking into yourself and you're using it as nourishment, but you can't give to that thing. And so there's an aspect of reciprocity and an aspect of giving up something that you want for the other object of love when we're talking about it in the Hebrew. So ultimately, what do you say that love is? Okay, so one of the things I find interesting that you pointed out there is that you, you cannot give a adequate or comprehensive definition of love. And I think that if we're talking about, because you mentioned this verse, of course, that's in my lesson as well, the, the verse, that, the passage that talks about God being love, can you give an adequate definition of God? You can give one that would be fitting, but you can't, I, I don't, it would be very difficult to say that here is a comprehensive understanding of what God is in a sentence or two, just like if you were writing a definition of him. And I think that there's an aspect where God is love in that sense as well, that it's difficult to give an exact or precise definition of love. The Bible talks about love so much that there's no way that I could go through all of it in, in this. We're going to go through a few passages, of course. But it would be impossible for me to give a comprehensive definition of what you're talking about there. And so because you have a sense of it, I do think that we can recognize it, but we can't always give a complete definition there. John? Right, well, I think that that's something that, that I had planned to talk about as well, and, and you're absolutely right to point that out, that there is a sense in which, just like many good things or virtues, love can be perverted. It can be twisted in such a way that it's actually harmful and does evil. But the perfect love that we're given by God, that God instilled in us, is something that is always good. And so it can be corrupted, but ultimately in its true and perfect form, it's always going to be something derivative of God. And so there is going to be a contrast there between things that are of God and things that are not God. And one of those contrasts is, is there love involved in this? And if there is, then it's something that is at least in some part of God. Even people that are horribly wrecked and, and don't know God and are outside of the godly family they have the ability to show or demonstrate love in some sense because they are created with that aspect of being godlike. They are God's creation still, and so even if it's an imperfect expression of it, they do have the ability to love and get things right at least from time to time, and so that is a godlike quality as well. So I thought that there was going to be an interesting thing that we do here because each week we have started our lesson with with 1 Corinthians 13, uh, 13. And that is appropriate. I think that that was a, it is where these three things are strung together in the scripture and the reason that we've been using it. But it's interesting that really that entire chapter is about love. In fact, it's called the love chapter. So let's go ahead and make some observations about the whole chapter in context as it relates to that verse. So let's go ahead and look at 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned but do not have love, it profits me nothing. What is the point of bringing up spiritual gifts, Bible knowledge, benevolence, all the things that he mentions? Why is he contrasting those things to love? Aren't these things, in a sense, an act of love? I mean, they are of God. Yeah, I think that that's exactly right, that if you want to understand why these things are being brought up, you have to look at the chapter in its proper context, which is, if you look at 1 Corinthians 12 and 1 Corinthians 14, this passage is sandwiched between two discussions about the proper use of things like spiritual gifts and the proper use of worship. And so if you understand that aspect of it, that he is engaging in a discussion about love, but he's specifically talking about love and how to be loving in those contexts. And so the Corinthian church is really abusing the gifts and the blessings that God has given to them in the same way that we can abuse or incorrectly apply the gift of love that God has given us, because all love is, is coming from God at some point, 
But even that can be corrupted in the same way that the miraculous gifts that the Corinthians had were being used improperly and in a way that was not loving. And so it's interesting here that what he's talking about is specifically that he sees these things being misused and he wants them to use correctly. And the quickest way to help them understand why the way that they are applying these spiritual gifts is not correct is because it is not backed by love. And so that's why he's drawing this contrast here between the way that they've been behaving and the way that they've been using their spiritual gifts and the way that it's actually to be used. They've essentially been using it as a bragging point to show off. That's not love. Love would be to use those gifts to better other people and to better and, and further the cause of the kingdom of Christ. And I think that it's interesting, too, that there's a progression here. Because if you're looking at the first thing that he says here, if you do not have love, I've become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. So in that instance, I'm just noise. I'm not useful. I'm not fruitful. I'm not actually doing anything good or helping anybody. I'm just making noise. And then on the next stage of that, he says that I'm nothing. I'm not even noise. I'm just Nothing. It's like he doesn't even exist. And then on the third stage of that, he says, it profits me nothing. And so these are the things that I think, regardless of what it is, whether it's a spiritual gift or a talent or just our lives in general, if we do not have love in them, this is the progression that we're going to go down that will become noise that is not benefiting anybody. We're not benefiting anybody else. And then we're just... It's like we're not there. And then finally, it doesn't even profit us. Even when we're doing things that people would perceive as good or perceive as love, if it's not truly backed by love, it doesn't profit us at all, even if it's things that seem to be good to other people. And I think that it's important also to point out that the reverse of this is also implied to be true. So if you do have love involved in these things, then the reverse must be correct as well, which would mean what? that if we do have love behind these things, we're going to be giving out useful information, a coherent message, something that actually helps a person in their life instead of noise. And instead of having no value, being nothing, we have infinite value. And we have infinite value because it's something that God has given to us. And also that it profits us not nothing, but everything. That there is a incalculable profit to us. And so... If you have these things that are true, then the reverse of them would be logically true as well. And ultimately, these things, uh, in other words, love and, and using these things in a loving fashion are marks of a Christian. But ultimately, it's the love that actually makes it a Christian act. So I think that that's fascinating, too. He's saying even people that can actually literally perform miracles can do so without it being backed by love. And, you know, we would think of somebody that can perform miracles. It was like, well, that person's obviously on God's side. That's got to be a Christian, right? Paul's saying, actually, no, not if it's not undergirded by love. If so, even if you're doing something miraculous and using power from God, it still profits you nothing. And so that's how fundamental love is to the Christian faith. Let's go ahead and look at the next few verses, 4 through 7. Love is patient. Love is kind and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. It does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It does not take into account a wrong suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. So one of the things that George was bringing up about here is the best way to understand a verse or to understand this passage is in its proper context. We often think about this verse as this is what you read at a wedding. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. I've performed a lot of weddings and I usually quote this scripture at least partially, usually the, the entire passage here, verses 4 through 7. Nothing wrong with talking about that in application to marriage vows. However, it's important for us to understand that's not actually the original context. It applies there, but the original context was actually in relation to your fellow Christians that are worshiping in the church with you. That's actually what Paul is talking about when he discusses this. And so as important as it is to apply all of these aspects of love to your spouse or a romantic partner, this is something that's supposed to apply to every Christian. So 
it's everybody in the church and really all of humanity that these things are supposed to apply to. This is the kind of love that God calls us to, a kind that has all of these aspects that we see. And this is how you know if it is really love or it's something that just appears as love from the outside. So in the same way you may recall in the last couple of lessons we've gone over, there is such a thing as a dead faith, and there's also such a thing as a, a false hope. That's something that we discussed as well. So there is such a thing as things that appear as though they're love but really aren't, in the same way that when we looked at faith and hope, there are false versions of that as well. There's a false version of love. And the way that you know whether or not something is truly love is you look at this passage. Because if all of these things line up, then you are truly loving someone. And if you look at verse 5, I think that that's a really interesting one. This is, of all the characteristics of love that this passage points out, so that's the one that stuck out to me. And the reason, it does not act unbecomingly. Well, what is unbecomingly? It could be a lot of different things, but he's essentially saying if you're acting in any way that is contrary to the godly nature of love. And the reason that, that stuck out to me is it reminds me of something my dad taught me. So my dad was a high school teacher for 27 years. And whenever we would go on a trip or we had to do something that was outside of the classroom where he couldn't give 100% supervision to every student the entire time they were there, like if he were to send us out for, for lunch at a field trip or something like that, he always used this phrase. He said, don't do anything stupid. And the reason that he said that is, he, he said, kids will invent new ways to do dumb things. And because of that, it is impossible for me to come up with every instance and every scenario where I might have to tell them, don't do this. And so if I say to them, don't do anything stupid, that covers everything. And I think that's essentially what Paul is doing here. He's adding that phrase in because it's sort of a, an umbrella description he's saying don't do anything that would be unbecoming of a christian don't do anything that is contrary to the godly nature and that is how you truly understand and and show other people love and i think it's interesting that at the end of this he says it bears all things believes all things hopes all things endures all things belief faith and hope so he's kind of foreshadowing verse 13 here that he's saying that for something to actually be love Faith and hope actually have to play into that. That they're an aspect of this as well. And so ultimately, he's, he's setting up his own punchline, as it were here, that he's going to be describing at the end of this chapter, that he's setting that up in the minds of his listeners, that for something to truly be loved, you have to have belief and you have to have hope in God. Oop, went too far. Uh, let's look at verses 8 through 10. Love never fails. But if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away with. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. Ultimately, the things that he's talking about here, whether it's prophecy, whether it's tongues, all of the different things that he's talked about, even knowledge, ultimately are half measures. And if they are not backed up by love, actually do more harm than good. Because I don't know about you, but if I had somebody with me that actually had the gift of prophecy, could, could tell the future, and that was a godly trait, or had the gift of speaking in tongues, I'm inclined to believe that person. But if it's not undergirded by love, what they're saying is very likely not true. And so these godly gifts that have been given to the Corinthians, if they're using them to convince people of things, but it's not actually undergirded by love, if that's not the foundation of what they're doing, then those gifts are actually more apt to mislead somebody than to lead them to the love of God. And so ultimately, he's saying the partial, those things that are half measures that are just intended to get there, those are going to be done away with. And ultimately, what he's talking about is how people will know that you are a follower of God. Because that's what that is, right? That's the purpose of a miracle. Is so people will know that what you are saying is of God. But there's going to come a time, the time that we're in now, where those things are done away with. Not going to have those anymore. If that happens, how are people going to know that we are followers of Christ? And what Paul is saying is, it's love. That's the key. That's what's actually going to show people that we are followers of Christ. I think we see that, for example, in John 13, 35, 
where Jesus is talking there and he says, they will know you by your love for one another. And so love is going to be the telltale sign. Real love, the kind of love that he's talking about, is going to be the indicator that other people know this is a person that actually has the truth and, and speaks the, word of, the words of God. That's how they're going to know that we are in a correct relationship with God. Let's look at verses 11 through 13. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I have also been fully known. But now faith, hope, and love abide in these three. But the greatest of these is love. In verse 11, what's with the child metaphor here? Why is he bringing that up? Because at first glance, it kind of seems out of place. So why is Paul using that here? No, I think that that's, that I think that that's correct. That he's showing this progression that if you have faith and you nourish it and you have hope and you nourish it, eventually your love is also going to be as a sort of a cause and effect relationship. It's going to be nourished and come to its fulfillment as well. So just like a, a child gradually grows when you, when you nourish their body, the same thing is going to happen to your spiritual life. If you continue to nourish it with faith and hope, love is going to, to be the outcome of that as well. So I think that's absolutely uh, correct as well. Daniel. Yeah, no, I, th- I think that that's actually an excellent point. That it's, I do think that that's part of the reason that Paul is bringing this up is because there should be a progression in understanding as well. Like you were saying that with little kids, sometimes you can hear what your parents are saying, but you don't fully understand or grasp the importance of it or why they're saying that or that sort of thing. To a Christian, when we start out, there are going to be aspects of God's love that we may not fully understand. And because of that, we're just going to kind of have to trust and and work that out ourselves uh, with the help of the Scripture and with the help of older and more mature Christians as well, of course. Uh, But we're going to have to work that out and, and grow and mature in that. And then we're going to get to a point eventually, and I don't think we ever stop progressing in this area, but we're going to get to a point eventually where, like you were giving the illustration there, the words are actually going to start meaning things to us, and we understand why they're there and why that aspect of our parents' love exists. And so the same thing I think is going to happen to us as well with God is that it's going to take time, it's not going to happen overnight, but if we continue to progress in our faith and progress in our hope, we're going to start to understand the love of God and get a better and clearer picture of what it actually is and what it means. And ultimately, I do think that these things do build on one another. So let's go ahead and look at John 15, 12 through 14. This is Jesus talking to his disciples here. And he says, This is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that a person will lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I mean, we, he kind of teases it there, but then he explains exactly what he's talking about, that No man has a greater love than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. And so he says it just a couple of verses later. If you want to love as Christ, you have to do so sacrificially. But I also think what it means is you have to love as Christ loved. Now, that's just a different way of phrasing essentially the same thing. But it's not just enough to do the acts that Christ did. It's also you have to actually love a person in the same manner in which Christ loved people, which means we have to treat people the way Christ treated people when he was on earth. That's part of the advantage of having him come to earth and live as a human being is we get to see that example. And so I think that that's absolutely correct that in the same way that Christ loved us, that means in the same measure, to the same degree, in the same way, the same aspects are going to be there. If we're going to have Christian love to love as Christ loved us, then we have to follow that example that he's given to us. And I think if we look at verse 13 especially, where he talks about him laying his life down for his friends, love means taking what God has given you and giving it away. There is nothing more fundamental to your being than life. It's the first gift God gave every single one of us in this room. Before he gave us anything else, he gave us life. That is the thing that makes us children of God, at least in the sense that he created us. Now, of course, we've become fully adopted children that Paul talks about later when we come into contact with Christ's blood. However, 
in the initial stage of that, the very first thing God ever gave to us is life. And because of that, the, the ultimate expression of love is to give up your life for someone else. Now, does that mean sacrificing yourself in the way that Jesus gave his life for another? Yeah, I think that that's absolutely a correct application of that. However, it's also true that in the same way that, God, uh, that Jesus gave up his life in the sense that he was willing to die for us, he also gave his life for people on a daily basis. It wasn't just a one-time act on the cross. When he is there and he's tired and he's hungry and he hasn't had any rest all day and he's ready to just go off by himself and pray and be with God, and then people that are hungry and people that are in need of healing show up, what does Jesus do? He's like, no, no, I need some personal time, and he just takes it. That's not what he does. He gives his life for people. And so his life, as he understood it, is that's something that was given to me by God, and so I must use it to accomplish God's purposes. Ultimately, when we become Christians, we forfeit our lives. And that life now belongs to God. And that means we have to use it in a way that God would use it if he were here. That's what it means to be a representative of Christ here on earth. And ultimately, I think that there's an important lesson to be drawn from this as well in verse 14. He says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. So what that indicates is Jesus' love is universal. He loves everybody. His friendship is not. So as important as it is to embody Christian love and the love of Christ, it's important to understand that just because his love is unconditional does not mean that he accepts every aspect of somebody that, you know, when someone is engaged in sin, that he's just like, yeah, that's fine. Jesus did not come in the world to say that, yeah, everything you guys are doing, that's fine. Just, just keep doing what you're doing. That's not the love of Christ. The love of Christ calls people to transformation. It calls people to to obey him and to follow him. And if we want to love as Christ loved, we have to be willing to do the same thing. Let's look at the next few verses. John 15, 15 through 17. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, because all things that you have heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain, so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give you. This I command you, that you love one another. So it's interesting that he says, no longer do I call you slaves. And I think that that's actually a reference to the Old Testament. Because in the Old Testament, God had prophets. He had people that were his servants, his mouthpieces, he said to them, go do this, and they didn't always exactly understand what they were doing. There's a lot of times in the Old Testament where God just tells somebody to go do something, and they had to go do it and just have faith that what God was, was telling them to do had some kind of merit. And sometimes we even see that there were prophecies that even they didn't really understand. We see that in Daniel, that Daniel's having a hard time wrapping his head around what God is telling him to tell other people. But now, because he loves us and because he has embodied love in the person of Christ, no longer are we slaves, but we're friends. We have a relationship to where we understand what God is trying to do, and that is an aspect of his love as well. And uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 12, you remember that it says that Paul essentially has to know himself to truly love. Well, that's what we're getting right here, is that because God knows us, because he chose us, because he understood who we are, and he understood, frankly, how broken we were, and chose to love us anyway. That's the ultimate expression of love there. Well, my, my time is up, and I had several other passages, uh, but I want to just go ahead and skip ahead to uh, my final slide here, if I can get there at some point. Oh, there we go. We'll, we'll go ahead and end with this passage. So you may recall that right before his death, Jesus is speaking to his disciples in Matthew 25, 37 through 40. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? The king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did so to me. 
See, we see a parallel here that we saw in 1 Corinthians 13, where it talks about miracles not being as important as love. The same thing happened in the verses previous to this one. And so what Jesus is saying here is, if you want to love God, if you want to demonstrate the love of God to other people, here's how you do it. You love my children. You love the people that I love. In the same way that we would love somebody because someone we love loves them, we extend that to other people. Thank you so much for your attention. I appreciate it.